Okay, I think uh, we'll go ahead and start. It's uh, 12.05 now. I hope that um, everyone is here, and I hope you enjoy. So thank you all for um, coming. We are going to talk today about funding beyond the SBIR, STTRs, R01s, and R21s for companies. My name is Verita Albelda, and I am in the Business Development Department at the Freemind Group, and I'm pleased to be presenting today's webinar, the second webinar of the Freemind Summer School. To learn more about the Freemind Group, you can visit our website at freemindconsultants.com. And to keep up to date on the latest in non dilutive funding, you're welcome to follow us on Twitter and YouTube, as well as join our LinkedIn group, non dilutive Funding for Life Sciences R&D. Past webinars are available on our YouTube channel, Freemind Group, and you will re be receiving an email with the slide deck and recording from today's webinar. Please feel free to share it among your friends and colleagues. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A. You can enter your questions in the question window at the side of your screen, and you are also welcome to call or email me direct directly with questions specific to your situation or science. My contact information will be available on the last slide of today's presentation. As I mentioned, today is the second webinar of the annual Freemind Summer School, R01s and R21s for Companies. You can find a recording of last week's webinar on our YouTube channel, and I hope you will join us on Wednesdays throughout the summer as we bring you free weekly webinars on different areas of interest related to non-dilutive funding. Just a little background on the Freemind Group for anyone who may not be familiar with us. The Freemind Group is a consulting firm specializing in non-dilutive funding. Actually, we're the global leader in non-dilutive funding, and our main objective is to help our clients get as much money as possible from non-dilutive sources. We look mainly towards the NIH and the DOD, as well as other government organizations such as BARDA, CDC, FDA, NSF, and more. We also work with private foundations where relevant, and uh, we'll look a little bit more into that later. We have um, close to 50 full-time employees now, and have been helping our clients in their quest for non-dilutive funding for 16 years. On behalf of our clients, we submit about 350 applications a year. And that's a great deal of experience, knowledge, and expertise, which is all put to work for our clients to increase their chances for winning awards. We work with all players in the life sciences field, academics, research institutes, and university medical centers, as well as companies from small startups of just a few people all the way up to large companies, including many of the large pharmaceutical companies, and with organizations not only in the U.S., but from around the world. The Freemind Group is basically a tool to help you maximize your non-dilutive funding potential. When we start working with a client, the first thing we do is identify the most relevant funding opportunities. This is a very important step. If you have great science but only apply for, for grants that are not relevant to your science or use the incorrect mechanism, you will not be successful despite the fact that your science is really deserving of funding. Our analysts then create a list of opportunities for you and together with you will create a multi-submission granting strategy in order to maximize your chances for success. We also manage the complex projects production process and lead a joint application writing process. We can't do this alone and we do need you on board in this joint effort since you are the experts in your science. Where relevant, we do also support final contract negotiations. So in the US, there is over $50 billion of awarded every year with or available every year with the main source being the NIH with 27 institutes and centers covering every indication and population, such as cancer or infectious diseases, aging, or child health. Uh, we have so here some examples of, of uh, institutes within the NIH, such as the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, and many others. Other sources within the, the HHS is, uh, the, is BARDA, FDA, CDC, and these each award funding to support specific projects. The DOD is another solid source of funding from the government through different specific mechanisms and programs, and of course there are some private foundations that provide grants to support R&D as well. 
As I mentioned, the NIH is really the main source of funding, with its budget being about $30 billion of the $50 billion available, and with somewhere around $26 billion devoted to extramural research, such as research project grants and R&D contracts. Taking a look at categorical spending from the last year, the tallest bar here is clinical research, and the others along the way are, are for different indications. Just to highlight a few, the spending on research in cancer and neuroscience fields in 2014 were close to $5.5 billion each, with infectious diseases close behind at just over $5 billion. That's over $15 billion in just these three fields, and there are over 200 areas of interest and with funding available to support your science. I'd like to take a step back for a moment just to last week's webinar, which was on the SBIRs and STTRs mechanism. In 2014, between the two, the grants came to nearly $700 million, including almost $170 million in SBIR Phase 1 and just over $400 million in SBIR Phase 2. Now, don't get me wrong, the SBIR and STTR mechanisms are great, and if you're eligible, you should certainly pursue them. But many companies may not realize that there's actually a large pocket of relatively untapped government funding just waiting to be accessed. The SBIR and STTR budgets are fixed, between them coming to only 3.4% of the entire budget, whereas the remaining 90 plus percent may be available to for-profit organizations. The amount that, that went to support R&D in 2014 through non-SBIR sources was close to a billion dollars, and that's not even counting the funds that went to industry as subcontractors or collaborators. This funding comes from R&D contracts, U mechanisms, which we'll be discussing in a few weeks, R mechanisms, and others. Of course, today we are discussing the R01 and R21 mechanisms, so let's take a little take a look at them. You can see here that in 2014, nearly $7 million was awarded for two, to for-profit organizations in the industry under the R21 mechanism and almost $100 million under the R01 mechanism. Just looking at the SBIR, STTR, R21s, and R01s in aggregate, at any given time, the NIH may be distributing $11 billion for new and ongoing projects. Of course, much of this is still going to academics, but there's no time like the present to start maximizing your potential by exploring these and all sources of funding available. So let's take a closer look at the specifics of these two mechanisms and some of their opportunities. I've included for you a, br a brief overview of the mechanisms that will help you determine which is relevant for your science. When you're looking at the R21s, there's, uh, they're focusing on exploratory or novel studies that break new ground or extend previous discoveries toward new directions or applications. These are more high-risk, high-reward type studies that could lead to breakthrough in a particular area or result in novel techniques, agents, methodologies, models, or applications that will impact biomedical, behavioral, or clinical research. Looking at the R21, the proposed project must be related to the programmatic interests of one or more of the participating NIH institutes and centers based on descriptions of their programs, and this is generally for larger-term projects. Breaking it down to see some figures here, the R21 can be up to two years and with a $275,000 budget in direct costs, max budget of up to $200,000 per year, and this is not including overhead. The R01 is available for up to five years with an open budget of up to $500,000 a year, totaling to $2.5 million. With proper justification and per approval, over $500,000 a year may be requested, again, not including overhead, which I'll touch on briefly later. The deadlines for submission are generally part of the NIH standard cycle, coming three times a year, in February, June, and the next one is right around the corner in October. Now, regarding eligibility, most, for most of the R21s and R01s, foreign organizations are eligible, although there are some exceptions. 
And I'd like to point out here that virtual companies are eligible as well. This is more recent, so some companies still don't know this, and I did want to just, um, just make sure that, that you are aware. Okay, now regarding the funding stage, um, the, or funding available for which stages of development, these two mechanisms will support all the way from basic research through even phase three of clinical with some overlap in the preclinical stage. In order to access these non-dilutive funds, there are two routes that you can take. Solicited, where specific solicitations will have a very targeted focus area. They'll be detailed in what the funding institute is looking to support, and I'll give you some uh, specific examples in the coming slides. Then there's the unsolicited, or investigator-initiated, under which approximately 70% of NIH awards fall. There's no specific call, no specific focus, and no specific request for a particular type of research. But this is really great because it then allows a researcher to step forward and present his wonderful science to the NIH. Here we have parent announcements for the R21 and R01 omnibus, or unsolicited, um, so unsolicited solicitations, with the outline of the budget, as mentioned earlier, and the approximate percent and figure available in the overhead or the indirect costs. So this is between 30 to 40% generally, and in the R21s, it could be up to $380,000. In the R01s, $3,500,000. In the R21, we're looking at parent announcement is the NIH Exploratory or Developmental Research Grant Program. And with the R21, it's the Research Project Grant. In order to find the grants available, this, the most simple way is to run a search on the NIH's website. And I ran one today to give you an idea of where, what it would generate, and I found 306 active R01 solicitations and 109 active R21 solicitations. Now this is the most basic and we'll only show you the, the um, solicitations that have a specific request. This is not counting the unsolicited opportunities. Looking at, while still general, um, a specific search term of cancer, I found 29 open R01 solicitations and 18 open R21 solicitations. Again, this is still very general, and if you are working in the cancer field, you will want to search according to breast cancer or prostate, pancreatic, whichever cancer it is that you're looking in, you'll want to look more specifically. On many occasions, an institute will issue a specific solicitation under both the R21 and R01 mechanisms, and you will then need to review and consider carefully the stage of development, scope of work, and budgetary restrictions in order to determine which would be the appropriate solicitation to support your science. You can see here on the side just a brief blurb from each R21 and R01 what types of things you'll be looking at in order to determine the relevance. We have here uh, some examples, one from the NCI, Research on Malignancies in the Context of HIV-AIDS, NIA, the National Institute of Aging, there's Pain in Aging, um, NHLBI, Selected Topics in Transfusion Medicine, uh, Biomarkers of Infection-Associated Cancers, and one from the NICHD as well, Development of Appropriate Pediatric Formulations and Pediatric Drug, drug Delivery Systems. Looking at uh, more specific opportunities that are available under the R21 mechanism, there are some here under bioengineering, looking at uh, exploratory or developmental bioengineering research grants. Under central nervous system, there's one here for neurobiology of migraines. Under infectious diseases, uh, research to advance vaccine safety. And under oncology, you can see that we have one here for biomarkers for early detection of hematopoietic malignancies. Now, these are just a few examples, and there are many, many more out there, so you will want to search for your specific science. Looking at the R01s, we have some examples from the same fields. Again, looking at bioengineering research grants, 
Um, under the central nervous system, we have drug delivery for nervous, nervous system disorders. In infectious diseases, we have NIAID clinical trial implementation grant. And under oncology, uh, there is, uh, again, with the biomarkers, uh, so that's going to be a paired solicitation. You have to figure out which one is most appropriate for your science. And uh, image-guided drug delivery in cancer. Again, I just want to reiterate that this is simply a sample and that there are many more opportunities and solicitations available, just in the specific solicitations and, of course, the unsolicited. So once you've submitted your grant application, what's the next step? I want to take a moment to just look at the, re the NIH review process, where, putting it simply, in reviewing and considering whether to fund your application, the reviewers are weighing the strengths versus the risks. And the way that they do this are by looking at two things, responsiveness and competitiveness. Are you responsive to the solicitation? Because no matter how good your science is, if you're not so responsive to the solicitation, you will not be awarded. And are you competitive? Looking at competitiveness, they're looking at five criteria on which you will then be scored. The significance of your research to, pu to public health if it is innovative and will make a change. Do you have the right leadership and team in place to successfully lead such a project? Do you have the right environment to support the work you propose? Um, but what about, but what makes the, the difference between a good application that isn't awarded and one that is, is your scientific approach, the milestones, the specific goals, and ultimately, top-notch science wins awards. Now, from a more broad perspective, I'd like to give you an idea of our approach to non-dilutive funding and how we recommend you maximize your chances for award. First of all, the most important thing is to know is the interest of the agency. What is on their agenda and what are they looking to fund? If necessary, communicate with the program officers. This is extremely important and valuable. You will need to focus your project application. Focus applications have a higher chance of being favorably re reviewed. And again, the NIH does not fund companies or labs, they fund projects. You don't want your proposal to come across to reviewers as overly ambitious or unrealistic. Make sure to ask for what is necessary. Don't inflate the budget or ask for too little. Having an accurate budget shows that you are realistic and understand your project. And make sure to, com to present a complete project. Have one comprehensive storyline. You can leverage on research collaborations. Whether or not the mechanism is required, or in a case where there is a gap in your capabilities, it's important to collaborate. Take on consultants, statisticians, or outsource work you're less proficient at or don't have the expertise to complete. Now, I'd like to emphasize the importance of targeting the right mechanism. As I'm sure you understood from the previous slides, there are many industry-oriented solicitations out there working through various mechanisms, including the R-Series grants, also the U01s, U19, as well as others. It's important to know your way around these mechanisms and that they represent more than just numbers and letters. They're, they represent requirement factors ranging from how many projects can be proposed, the nature of the project, budgetary factors, cooperations from the NIH, and, and more. There's also different pockets of money for the industry as well as uh, academic industry collaborations, and you will need to identify and target which is best for your project. It is vital to understand the different sizes of awards and success rates, know the different funding levels, and match them to your requirements and needs. And of course, conduct a thorough strategic assessment. What are your objectives? What research projects do you have, and in what stages of development are there? Where would you like your research to be in the next 12 to 24 months? And what is the potential for success for each research project? All this should be done with the goal of creating a multi-submission granting strategy. So just going back a little bit about FreeMind again, um, we do have a close to 50 full-time employees with a team of scientific analysts and grant consultants dedicated to providing clients with the best strategy for targeting non-dilutive funding opportunities, as well as the best execution of these strategies. All of our analysts and managers have a great deal of experience and expertise, which is channeled into your application to make it the most complete, best written, and highest quality application that can be submitted. 
I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank one of our senior analysts, Dr. Seagal Katz, for her assistance in preparing this webinar. Just a brief summary regarding FreeMind's approach to the strategic assessment and to our core services. We begin by understanding your science, where you are now, where you'd like to be in the next 12 to 24 months. Based on a series of conference calls, as well as information you may provide us with, we'll, we will draft for you a, a summary of which op opportunities are available to support your science. We will then present it to you and together with you create that multi-submission granting strategy. The strategic assessment is an ongoing process taking place throughout the, the terms of our engagement where any, any new opportunities that come up will be presented to you and integrated into your strategy. Once the client decides to move forward with a specific funding opportunity, we begin strategizing as to the specifics, helping you throughout the, the process of the application, working with you in the writing of the application, and work and throughout any negotiation that comes up afterwards throughout the entire process from the beginning to finish. Prior to submission, our analysts will review the work and proposals will be submitted once they are the best possible application. Thank you very much for your time, and I will now answer some questions that have come in during the, the webinar. Um, I don't know if I'll have a chance to get to all of them, but I would be happy to speak with everyone over the phone or by email to discuss specifics to your case. Okay, so we have here um, regarding an academic collaboration. Like I said, the R01s and R21s are available to industry and there is no need for an academic collaboration. It is, it's beneficial, it can't hurt, but it's not necessary. Um, and on another question regarding eligibility, these grants are available for, for non-US companies and organizations. There are a few of the R01 or R21 uh, solicitations that may have requirements of the that the organization be based in the United States but that's only a few most of them are available for everyone um, and actually for virtual companies as well your your actual um, lab space can be located outside of the United States okay um, I have a, a question here about the availability of the webinar I will uh, be sending out an email with the slide deck and with a recording of this webinar today. And, um, and of course, it will be available on our YouTube channel, as will all of the webinars throughout the summer series. And I think that's it for now. Again, you can email me directly with any questions you may have. My email address is verad at freemindconsultants.com. My phone number is 617-648-0340 at extension 215, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much, and I'm glad that you joined us today.